Welcome to the Famous Musicians Podcast. This is our 14th installment for June 2018. Uh, I'm here with Alejandro Lombardi, uh, also known as The Frenetic, who is a producer and a rapper. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, start off with uh, Alejandro. Uh, how did you get into music? Yeah, so th- thanks for having me. I Absolutely. appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> what got me into music? So pretty simple. My mom forced me to take piano lessons when I was eight years old. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty much my introduction. And, you know, my, my family is, is musical. They have a musical background. My mom plays the keys. Okay. Um, my dad plays a bit of guitar. Um, and my brother, he, he plays the saxophone. Um, so... Yeah, just having that musical background in my family is what, what I joke around and I say it pressured me into that. But, you know, my mom, I'm thankful that she got me into piano lessons. So, yeah, I mean, that was the beginning. And then and then uh, when I made it to uh, elementary school and middle school, I was playing in the band. So I picked up more instruments, playing mm-hmm. the drums, the bass, guitar and things like that. So, gotcha. yeah, so it was pretty much from an early age, my okay. family. Yeah. Um, so, was there any background in um, uh, church or religious music or anything like that? Um, so, I come from a Catholic family. Um, I wouldn't say that my church was very heavy on the music, uh, but in high school, I was uh, in gospel choir. So, okay. I was, yeah, I was singing and, and playing drums in the gospel choir. So, nice. um, there was a heavy influence on that, you know, later in my life in high and school. It, no, this was actually a Catholic gospel choir? Yeah. That's ridiculous. Okay, cool. I gotta find. Yeah, no, <laughs> not, a, like, not a Baptist gospel choir. Yeah, Catholic no, that's that's an, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I never heard of that. I need to find out where that's happening. Um, yeah, it's great. Yeah, cool. Um, so, okay, um, did you start with um, being a rapper, or did you like first get into it as a producer, like rapping, uh, yeah. making beats? Yeah. So um, I started rapping first. Um, and basically how it went was I was in a little rap group. Uh, we, we called ourselves MSU. And uh, it was just a rap collective, you know, but we didn't have anybody making beats. We didn't have a producer. Right. And we couldn't, you know, we didn't have much money to spend on the, at the time on beats and, you know, investing in producers and, and, sound, and uh, sound engineering and things like that. So, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I said, all right, I'll be the guinea pig, you know, I'll, right. I'll learn. And uh, that's that's how I started. You know, I just started out with uh, putting loops together. Right. Um, you know, on, uh, on uh, di- you know, different websites and found loops and stuff, just threw them together. And then later on, I started taking it more seriously and learning how to sequence myself and, you know, sample myself and, and, and right. put, you know, all the musical background that I had into that world as well. So um, did you, uh, I'm just trying to think, like, on, on the earlier side of it, um, were you, was there ever any uh, time where you found like impediments of putting a beat out there? Like you just say like, oh, I, I want to put out this beat for MSU, whatever, but I just like, I just don't think the bass sounds right or like kick drum's not really popping. So, you know what, I'm just going to hold back or, or di- you know, or, was there anything like that? Well, I would say that, you know, at that time when I was beginning, you know, I was quite naive, you know, I, I, I you know, I had the musical background, but I really just went off of whatever the guys in the group liked. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes I would make a beat and they didn't really like it. You know, that, that happens. Uh, you know, no hard feelings on that. But I wasn't at a point where I was able to scrutinize my own work and say, oh, okay. yeah, and say like, oh, well, I need to, you know, fix the level of the kick drum there. Or I need to, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't at that level yet. Right. You know? Okay. Right. 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 Yeah. So you were just, you were just operating on instinct and you're just like, this right. just sounds pretty dope. I'm just gonna bounce it. We're just gonna wrap on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did you ever encounter that further on? That you got to a certain point where you were like so professional that you're like now you had all these incredibly high standards and you just couldn't ever make something that you felt strongly enough. So you had all these like creative blocks. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. now you have shit like yeah. that. Okay. So, so now that can be quite the issue. You know, I mean, now I'm at a point where I'm dealing with. Uh, fighting off my own perfectionism you yeah. know I'm I'm hella perfectionist and I need to stop with that you know and so I'll, I'll be working on the same beat for days because I can't get the, the finger drumming pattern exactly on the beat you know okay because I don't like to quantize anything so I'll be right. sitting there just for example yesterday I was sitting in front of my beat pad for nine hours 
trying to master this beat that I was making because I want to play it live. So, right. you know, I have those moments of, you know, where my perfectionism kind of takes over and prevents me from moving on. I could have probably made two more beats in that time span. But right. <laughs> but you thought, like, what's the point? I it, it, This isn't right. I'm going to worry about this unless I fix it now. Exactly. Right, yeah. Um, just because now that's touching on something that I do, you know, uh, producing myself. Uh, do you ever do you ever find that it's not anything related to the pattern, but that you're actually, you, you spent the entire day and fretted it away because of, like, some, like, high-pass filter on, like, one of the instruments isn't, perfectly yeah. shit like that okay yeah okay. absolutely you know yeah. like especially when it comes to automation yeah so, it's like this could have gotten quite a little slower yeah. and, okay cool i'm always so i'm always uh, nitpicky ab about things like that another thing i'm nitpicky about that i really shouldn't be it's kind of silly is my fade outs so oh. if you have a beat with the fade out i'm so it has to feel right right you're like this is too sudden this is too yeah. abrupt this yeah. has got it that's so funny. Because there's usually like a gold standard. They say like 10 seconds, you know, is usually the uh, okay. the max right. that you should have. But sometimes that's too short. Sometimes that's too long. Yeah. And I'll be sitting there, you know. And then other things like um, if I have a drop, you know, and I'm dropping before the hook. And right. I have a, and I have a sweep before the drop, the frequency sweep. Right. Oh, man, I'll be sitting there for hours, like, trying to get the timing on that right. Or, like, what frequency should it stop at? Oh, wait, if it's at this frequency, the snare is still coming through and this and that, you know. Yeah. So. I noticed that I was, I, there was a producer I, I, I worked with on um, my first album, uh, Jonathan Stein. And he, he would put in all sorts of crazy like bloops and like space sounds and or like it would just sound like a vacuum cleaner very slowly starting up and, he, and it was so funny because i was just like why would you care about exactly how this is sequenced but he would obsess so it would just be like well the second second of this vacuum cleaner has to hit 600 hertz in like exactly this way and it made i mean it sounded great but it was like it didn't make i i was so i always puzzled over it because i was like yeah. This seems like you would just want a random sound, but the random sounds were like what took up all of his attention. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and you probably know that very well. I mean, you're coming yeah. from a background of being a pianist. Right. So, you know, when it comes to performance. Right. You know, if you make a little screw up or whatever, the audience isn't going to know. You're going to yeah. know. And you're that's, know. that's why you get right. so caught up because right. you know. And you yeah, that's know, absolutely true. It's the that's same thing with producing. So. Right. And it well, in, and because it exists in a recorded medium. Exactly. So it's like you. Yeah. It has to be. Um, okay, what contributes to your focus on earlier hip hop? Like, I, I hope you don't f find that presumptuous. That listening to a lot of your work, I felt like it's like pre-trap, and it reminds me a lot of like Shook Ones by Mob Deep and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, no, it's it's not presumptuous at all. I mean, um, it's it's funny how I got into hip hop the way that I'm into it now. When I was growing up, uh, you know, like. As young as seven, eight years old, you know, I was listening to like Fifty Cent, and I was yeah. listening. To, so I, was I. Yeah, yeah I mean, because <laughs> that was the time, you know, yeah. it was like um, early two thousands, late nineties. So yeah, so I was already kind of growing up on that. Yeah. Not that Fifty Cent is is really like you know classic hip hop sound or anything, but he was sort of I, I think that transition between the two. Yeah. So there's that, but uh, I kind of fell in love with hip hop on a more serious scale when my friend introduced me to Tribe Called Quest um, and the very first track I ever really heard by Tribe Called Quest was Luck of Lucian and uh, awesome. they say I, I forget the name of the sample or who the sample was but he sampled a, a big band oh it's not Roy Ayers it's big band yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, <laughs> I just it blew me away you know because yeah. I'm coming from a place of loving jazz music and, and loving oh, things yeah, like that oh yeah of course yeah yeah so that blew me away and I didn't realize you know how um how much hip hop and jazz music can work together in concert. Yep. And so I think it was a mix of, you know, having that early exposure to, to hip hop when I was young and then being reintroduced to uh, people like Tribe Called Quest when I was in high school. That blend, I mean, that's what I fell in love with. So that's yeah. just the music that I make. Um, uh, this is a non sequitur, but because you brought Tribe Called Quest, um, what was your feelings on uh, Midnight Marauders? Do you ever hear that? Yeah, of course. Uh, so D the the winter Carvel get a milkshake are just like it's just like perfect. It's like a perfect song. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean that whole that whole album right, is just yeah. it's uh -huh. just yeah. I mean I would have to say my five my favorite tribe album would be Low End Theory. 
Yeah. But Midnight Marauders is a close second for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, okay. Another question. Okay. Um, top three rappers. Uh, if you had to pick, obviously, you. Uh, it, because your knowledge of hip hop, that will obviously be a diff- difficult question to answer. Well, that's a <laughs> that's funny that you say that because the, the question is difficult to answer because um, I don't I, I don't know how to say this in a way where it doesn't sound like you know like I'm throwing shade at anybody. But I don't really I don't idolize rappers, you know. Okay. Um, I know that a lot of people really do, and, and that's that's great. You know, if, if you're into hip-hop and that's what you're into, that's awesome. But right. I'm really into the production aspect of things. So oh, the reason that's why that's a hard question to answer is because I'm always listening to the production. Right. Yeah, and, and I do listen to the rapper. I, I check out the flow, and I see, you know, what is he saying, this and that. Um, but anyway, my answer. So I would have to say one has to be Q-Tip. Just because of you know what I already said, uh, I'm absolutely in love with uh, Tribe Called Quest, and I think Q-Tip had you know a way of mixing his flow with his opinion, and you know Five Dog did that as well. Yep. Um, but his was a more comedic way of doing it. He was like the clown, you know. He was, yeah. Yeah. He was yeah. the clown of the. He group. was like aware that it was a like a polarizing opinion. But he still was gonna say it. But he like yeah. he knew it was kind of silly to be like that forthright about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas Q-Tip, he, he had that more serious flair to him. So I always admired how he was able, you know, also being such an early pioneer in hip hop, uh, being able to, you know, mix that flow and mix that with with his message. So uh, Q-Tip. Yep. Another uh, would be J Cole. Yep. Um, J Cole simply because I think his lyricism is unmatched. Um, just, you know, even if you're looking at his most recent project, um, KOD, the, the, I believe it's the last song, 1985, where he's just talking to, you know, these SoundCloud rappers, like, look, you know, there's nothing wrong with being young and being a SoundCloud rapper, just recognize what you're doing. And he said that in his own J. Cole, J. Cole eloquent way, you know, <laughs> yeah. in, in rhyme. And so I always admired his storytelling ability. And then last but not least, I would have to say Logic. Yep. Um, I love Logic because primarily his flow. Um, I think his flow is really reminiscent of uh, percussion. And, and I think that's how a flow should be in yeah. hip hop. And so being a drum uh, drummer, I notice, you know, when he goes in with the fast flow that maybe it's syncopated on this bar or maybe it's this or that. Yep. So I always admired him for that. And, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate how he addresses, you know, topics like peace, love, and positivity and, and inclusivity and things like that. Uh, yeah. But I really admire his, his flow above all else. Um, that's what, He is the one that's Young Sinatra? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like Logic, too. Uh, okay. Um, and then, okay. Uh, okay, what are your thoughts on people that say in listening to rap that they don't have any interest in the production or the ability of the rapper, but the message. What's the message? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, listen, I mean, like I was saying before, you know, I for one, you know, I don't really idolize rappers like that. Some people do. Right. So when everybody's listening to hip hop, they approach it in a certain way. So when I approach it, I'm, I'm listening to the beats, you right. know, I'm listening to how it sampled this or how tasteful, you know, that includes jazz or R&B music, you know, so I'm focused right. on that. Other people are focused on the message, you know, other people are really listening to, you know, is, is J. Cole addressing that one social issue that is hot right now? Or, right. you know, are they making uh, an example for, you know, people in hip hop to look after, you know, so yep. I'm not one to say, you know, you have to focus on this, you got to focus on that. I think it's important that people are listening to the lyrics. Right. Because they spent time writing those lyrics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and making it, you know, a message that they want to get across. But, um, yeah, I mean, to I'm not... To Yeah, I'm not focused on the message, really. Yeah. I was just thinking of that because uh, there's a friend of mine. I was telling him about... Um, what the heck is it? Oh, gosh. What the, what's the name of this rapper? It's, um, it's a young guy completely forgot his name 
But anyway, I was I was telling I was listening to one the one of the Method Man and Red Man uh, collaboration albums. I've, yeah. That's um, Big Dogs, How High, all that stuff. Um, I, I com- I'm like I'm completely blanking on the name of that album. But there's two. There's like one, and then there was a sequel album that was. Oh, built for Cuban Links. No, it wasn't built for Cuban Links. It was. Um, uh, oh gosh, what the heck is it? Um, oh, it won't come to me. But it's it's a Method Man, Red Man, and it's just the two of them being oh, silly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but the first one, I was just listening to it, and and um, uh, and I was telling him about how much I appreciated all these references. They're like talking about Freddy Krueger, yeah. and then like something that happened in 1993, and then they're like connecting it to all this stuff. Because as you probably if you listen to my stuff, you know I would I would like that because that's what I'm listening for, and like that kind of like very like all across the spectrum type of rapping. Yeah. And then like Method Man can do that in like a very smooth delivery, just being like. I'm, I like, talked about all this stuff in a room full of crackers. I might cut the cheese. Just stuff like it is like all this like really like woo. Just like a, this. Woo. Yeah, man. And and he was like, I was telling it to my friend. He goes, Oh yeah, that they're just being smart. And I was like, Yeah, it's smart. And he was like, Yeah, but it's smart. Like it's not, it's not talking about a message. And I was like, Oh okay. I didn't know they had to be wearing like Greenpeace jackets for it to be like a dope album. But uh, you know, I guess you're right. To each his own. Yeah, to each his own. To each his own. Yeah. That's funny though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know all those guys. I mean, would say, oh, this guy. I'm sorry, this guy's got a pigeon on his hand. Yeah. That's not his pigeon either. That's yeah, welcome that's to New York, Beastmaster. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, would saying, you know, they were always kind of just, you know, like I don't give a fuck. I'm gonna rap what I want. Right, I'm just gonna say whatever it. the heck I want to exactly. say. Exactly, and, and that kind of birthed. I mean, in a way, you know, I'm not a hip hop musicologist or anything, but I think that birthed, you know, a lot of the uh, playfulness that comes in comes in hip hop was Wu Tang Clan. Right. I mean, because listen to what they were rapping about. Like they had like weird, wild stories, and like right. they were borderline horror hip hop in, in a way in some albums. Yep. Um, uh, oh, uh, uh, Grave Diggers. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, yeah. I, I think uh, you need that too because you need to have fun in, in hip hop as well. It can't yeah. be all serious all the time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's fine. What role should uh, hip hop play, if any, in political affairs? Should it be advancing a cause, or is it enough for it to be just a frank expression of how the artist is feeling at the time, at the time it's written? Yeah. So. All right, so, you know, like a bit that, that I said, you know, to each his own, but I've been hearing that sort of argument or that sort of question coming up a lot recently. Right. Um, and, you know, especially with the political climate and everything like that. Right. And so, you know, I have to say this, you know, you can't ignore hip-hop's influence on, on politics or vice versa. You right. You know, politics influence on hip-hop. I mean, especially if you're looking at uh, groups like N.W.A., you know, they were yeah, that's always... Yeah, a good point. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's really good. Two live crew and, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. exactly. Like, right. that was the core. But yeah. you also have to realize that hip-hop wasn't born being a, a political commentary. Right. It right. was never born that way. Hip-hop right. was born in the Bronx on the street, and people were just dancing, and, you, you know... It's, you a f- had, it's a festive thing. It's a musical thing. Exactly. It's not a reaction to some political movement. It's just a it's, musical form. Exactly. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so... Right. I think a lot of people kind of would like to attribute hip hop to being really socially active, but it's not always that way. So, you know, I think it's good that you have uh, certain types of hip hop that comment on the political climate. I mean, if you look at Co- uh, Common, uh, you know, not that he's making uh, uh, albums anymore as like he used to, but he's an activist now, you know, so he speaks his mind on yeah. political things. And, you know, and so he's a hip hop artist and he's, uh, you know, one of the pioneers of hip hop, you know, looking at what he's done. And if you look at um, Pete Rock. Yeah. Yeah. So Pete Rock. Yeah. yeah Pete Rock. He, he's yeah. uh, really if you look on his social media, he's always talking about, you know, his opinions on, you know, Donald Trump and. And uh, what's going on with, with you know, bring anything, you know, from, from race relations to, you know, the NFL and things like that. So, right, 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 you right, know, right. I, I don't think that hip hop will ever be separated from the political commentary. Um, but I don't think that it necessarily has to be tied to that. So Right. It, you can use it to, to advance that, but it doesn't exist only for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cycling back, just thinking about it, saying listening pro- to production. Uh, this also ties into politics a little bit, but um, like, what's your opinion on just only t- taking aside just like personal statements 
and his social media, like just just analyzing just the production for Kanye. What what are your thoughts on Kanye? If you're Kanye. just talking about production. So Kanye was always somebody that I admired for his production. I mean, back right. to the early days, you know, he was he was soul and hip hop. That's right. what he was. Now, as he's been progressing with his artist persona and his character, um, I think his his production took a big turn. Okay. It's really not what it used to be, and that's okay because you can't be making the same you know records for 20 right. years, you know 25 years, however long he's been going at it. I think it's like only 20, but um, you know, I think that Kanye now is not really somebody that I listen to. Has nothing to do with his political. Has nothing to do with that. Right. It's just I don't really like his production anymore. Okay. But back in the day, yeah, okay. of course, yeah. Um, would you say like the zenith was like graduation or like? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also when he was producing for other guys too. I mean. Yeah. Before he was ever all his the stuff solo for Jay Z was like yeah. Exactly. Even before he was a solo artist, he was making hits, um, just with brilliant soul soul um, soul samples and like he he really popularized you know taking a, a vocal sample. Pitching it up maybe like eight steps to an octave and making it sound like a chipmunk, like that was his thing. That was his thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I for, yeah you forget that, but it's like yeah. that's totally something that he was yeah. doing. Um, I was thinking of a. Um, uh, it was there was an interview with Jamie Fox on Colbert, talking about Jamie Fox meeting, um, meeting Kanye at one of his house parties, and he, he was telling him about like when he met Kanye to do the vocal for um, Slow Jams. And he goes like, I have a song for you. And he went, oh great, you have a song for me to sing? He's like, yes, I do. And and so he sings it for Jamie Foxx and Jamie Foxx like dresses it up in this like soul singer way. And then like, he's just like, what are you doing? <laughs> he's just like trying to pull my r and influence. He's like, don't do that. <laughs> he's yep, just like, that's... just sing it exactly how he gave it to you. He's like a control, control freak. But, and, and Jamie Foxx was like, oh, like, Oh, this guy's like a young upstart. He's such a micromanager. He's not gonna make it. Yeah. And he said like he went away to do a film, and then he came back, and then he was like, s- s- his voice on Slow Jams is like number one. And he's like, oh, this is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I mean, Slow Jams was just such a great, great record on its own. I mean, when you had Twister come in on that <laughs> yeah, song, yeah, exactly. And then oh, the way yeah. they introduced, like, I have somebody who could do it fast. <laughs> <laughs> And you go, I'm like, how do you yeah, even do so that? Good. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the best best uh, Kanye songs. Yeah. I love that song, yeah. Do you believe there's enough material in classical music samples to rival the Motown and Soul Records more frequently sampled? Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, all right, well, I mean, well, I guess it depends. Well, even if it... It depends on if you're talking about the classical era or if you're talking about classical music. Classical, I say, I meant cla- the entire thing. Right. I mean, even if you were just talking about the classical period in its own, there would still be more stuff yeah. to sample than soul. But, I mean, especially if you're talking about classical music in general, like, bro, classical, romantic, like, oh, forget about it. I think that a lot of people neglect it because, okay, well, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, first of all, I think people go to soul records simply because it's like one of the first versions of popular music that was enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, you think about soul, everybody was jamming out to soul music and R&B music. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that's that's the truth. But um, the other reason is probably because, you know, hip hop obviously stems from a lot of um, uh, black and Hispanic culture, right? Mm-hmm. So. When you're thinking about soul, you're you're absolutely thinking about you know African American culture. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and so I think those samples, tied with the fact that they actually sound good, um, is is the reason why it's it's, it's in consistent hip-hop with the whole cultural history and all that's yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, um, I do think that it's a mistake to neglect the you know all classical music because oh my god it's it's okay well first of all. <laughs> There's no copyright stuff. There's right. no copyright stuff. That didn't exist yet. Right. I, yeah, I don't think that existed until it was like the late uh, 1800s or something like yep. that. Yeah, maybe. I, I could be wrong. I'm not sure. But, you know, if you sampled anything from a classical record, it would, it would be it would be copyright free, royalty free. 
And the other thing is that the instrumentation is so varied. I mean, you have everything, man. You have strings, you have oboes, you have woodwinds, you have uh, voice. Um, if you listen to like, um, you know, chamber music with young male singers, you know, castrated, castrated castrati. male singers, castrati, exactly. Castrati, yep. You know, that's a whole, uh, that's a whole unexplored area of sampling. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about all of the the pitching that that Kanye West would do to the castrati. <laughs> pitch him up, pitch him down, like, forget about it, man. It's all yeah. over. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, yeah. Um, I was, the only thing I was thinking about is, um, so, the third movement of Mozart's 40th symphony is a G minor, and, yes. right, yeah. so the, the, this, the three, four, that's keep it moving. Really? Yeah. So, so, but he do it in four four. Keep it moving. Yeah, but it's the red man. That's a, that's a sample. Okay, okay. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, and I have to yeah. I have to remind. I don't. This is kind of it's a a little bit uh, provocative title of a of a group. But I'm just gonna it's it's a group's name, so I'm just gonna say it. But there's a group called <laughs> Cunning Linguists. I don't know if you know oh, that. Yeah, okay. yeah, of course. Th yeah. Uh, what was it? Um, what the hell was it? There's, it's based off of the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, but it's a... Uh, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it's great. I forgot. I, I'm going to figure out what the title is of that. I'll put it yeah. in the description or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, man, you can't forget those classical records. Go yeah. sample. Go sample. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm trying to think. Okay, okay. And the, the way I usually conclude any of these podcasts is, yeah. is there any, um, is there any uh, record or performance coming up that you'd like to use uh, this interview as an opportunity to promote, to for to get more people to come to, whether there's an event or an album that you you're releasing? For sure, yeah. So um, this Friday I'm dropping my very first B tape entitled Early Joints. Early Joints. Um, it's just a. Uh, I've been producing for about two years now, so Early Joints is kind of just representative of the journey that I've been having the past two years producing, so it has some early early joints on it, some yeah. early beats on it, so yeah, I'm dropping that on June 8th, this Friday. June 8th, this Friday, you heard it first, okay, uh, this concludes uh, the Famous Musicians podcast, the 14th episode, uh, please uh, join us for the next one. Thank you.